Hello, everybody. Everybody, um, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the start of the Spring 2021 Virtual Book Talk series, uh, sponsored by the Program in the History of the Book in American Culture, uh, or FIBAC, uh, at the American Antiquarian Society. I'm Kevin Wisniewski. I'm the Director of Book History and Digital Initiatives here at AAS, uh, and I am joined today by my friend and colleague Amanda Kondik. Today's event uh, features University of Utah professor Craig Dworkin, uh, who in a few moments will discuss his book, Radium of the Word. Uh, it is a part of a series of monthly book talks dedicated to the history and future of the book, where each month uh, we invite an author of a recently published monograph or digital equivalent uh, to share that work and to answer uh, a few questions from those in attendance. Now, before uh, asking Craig to join us here today, uh, I do have a few introductory points. Uh, first, uh, for those unfamiliar with AAS, um, the society was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. We are a research library and learning society located in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, devoted to uh, the understanding and sharing of history and culture of this nation before the 20th century. Uh, as a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. Uh, we are using uh, Zoom webinar today as our platform. Uh, and so right now I would like to turn uh, over to my colleague, Amanda, who will give you all a quick overview of the platform and some of the features we'll be using today. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome everyone. So before we get started, I do have a few notes on the mechanics of our Zoom webinar format for those who are not familiar with it. So for the Q&A portion of this program, we'll be using the Q&A function located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you have any questions for Craig during or after his presentation, please type them in there. And as attendees, you'll also have the option to upvote your favorite questions by selecting the thumbs up icon, which we will answer at the end of our program. Uh, the chat function is also open, so feel free to send your comments to all attendees and panelists. And throughout the presentation, I will also be posting additional information and links to the chat relating to our speaker, AAS, and FIBEC. And you should be able to save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. And if you have any problems with your visual or audio settings, you can also message me privately in the chat. And finally, I would like to remind everyone that we are recording this program. So for those who cannot attend or for those who would like to rewatch it, we'll be posting, posting it to the AAS YouTube cha cha channel. <laughs> so thank you everyone and Kevin, back to you. Great, <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Uh, now I would like to introduce today's guest. Uh, Craig Dworkin is professor of English at the University of Utah, where he teaches literary history and theory. Uh, Dworkin is the author of four monographs, including Reading the Illegible from Northwestern University Press and No Medium from MIT. Uh, and he's the editor of numerous collections, including Against Expression, an anthology of conceptual writing with Kenny Goldsmith, and The Sound of Poetry, The Poetry of Sound, co-edited with Marjorie Perloff. Uh, and I would like to add, he's also the editor of Eclipse, an online archive of innovative writing. Uh, his essays have appeared in PMLA, Critical Inquiry, Contemporary Literature, October, College English, and the American Book Review. Uh, and Craig is also a poet and book artist, which includes the Pine Woods Notebook uh, published in 2019 by Kenning Editions. Uh, he is the author of uh, two monographs released uh, just this past year, Dictionary Poetics, published by Fordham University Press, and from the University of Chicago Press, Radium of the Word, a Poetics of Materiality, which is the subject of today's talk. Links to both of those titles will be added to the chat for those interested in ordering copies. Uh, now, it is my pleasure to welcome Craig Dworkin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Amanda, um, and everyone at 
AAS. Uh, I'm really honored to be talking to this group. And I thought I would, um, since we're on Zoom, I thought I would Zoom in, um, look at a single poem, short poem, uh, by Russell Atkins, one of the writers I focus on in the book, um, by way of demonstrating in a very concrete way what I mean by a poetics of materiality uh, and the kind of radical formalism uh, for which I've been advocating. Uh, and I'll do this in um, three different parts, um, and then we can open, open up and zoom out for a conversation more generally. Uh, this kind of radical formalism, I want to argue, uh, allows us to unpack even the most seemingly abstract uh, elements in a poem like Russell Atkins' Spiritual. Uh, and I want to hold in suspension for a moment. Um, whether we see the, the abstract elements in this poem as quotation marks or ditto marks or moments of apostrophe or contraction even, uh, I'll be suggesting all of these at some point, but these marks that in any case uh, would seem to be the very sign of refusing to say, and which nonetheless, I wanna argue, uh, speak directly to uh, fraught politics uh, of the then current civic affairs um, and the sociability of texts themselves taking an active part in the construction of explicitly activist communities in Cleveland in the 1960s. Let me start with uh, the title. The poem announces the source of the language that it's quoting, a uh, African-American spiritual, um, the title of which in turn, Oh, Didn't It Rain, uh, Atkins articulates down the page with that, that spatial distribution reminiscent uh, maybe of something like uh, Stéphane Mallarmé's En Coup de Day, uh, or perhaps as a gridded revision of Guillaume Apollinaire's Il Pleu. Uh, it's raining women's voices as if they had died even in memory, uh, as the, the first line of Apollinaire's poem translates. Uh, as if Apollinaire himself were writing an uncanny, proleptic elegy for uh, this Library of Congress entry. Uh, and indeed, in the first decades of the 20th century, folklorists, uh, sociologists, traced the origins of the song, Oh, Didn't It Rain, back to African-American work songs um, with more extended narratives about Jonah uh, and about Noah the famous uh, sociologist Howard Odom uh, said, quote, the present day song uh, that apparently originated in the plantation and slave spirituals is less elaborate, having only portions of the old song. And he quotes the opening of those more recent abbreviated versions. Uh, pull this up for you. God told Noah about the rainbow sign, Lord, didn't it rain? No more water, but fire next time. Oh, didn't it rain, hallelujah. So Atkins' redactions, uh, in which the quotation marks seem to replace the missing lyrics, might be read as a literalization of Odom's own summary of the song's textual history, right? Spiritual, Atkins' poem, quotes only portions of the old song. And the portion that it does quote encodes a linguistic analog to the call and response structure of the song spiritual. It's obviously this familiar colloquial construction, uh, oh, didn't it rain? But it's grammatically unusual as an interrogative that anticipates its own answer in order to make any sense. Um, in the case of this specific spiritual, moreover, the suggestion uh, of ditto marks here, I think, resonates thematically, forecasting that relentless, uh, repeated reiteration of the quadragesimal uh, 40 days and 40 nights uh, with the rain there uh, encoded literally uh, in the refrain that constitutes the song and its structure. Uh, I think that rain may also be visually encoded uh, if we read the glyphs as um, iconic or pictorial 
illustrations of raindrops. Uh, the page there is a sort of window pane. Uh, or in the broader context of the song about the flood, uh, they might be read as inch marks, measuring the accumulation of the cataclysmic rainfall, or even, uh, this may be more fanciful, but maybe even the hoof prints of, of the paired ruminants queuing up there for the ark. Uh, or, I don't know, I can't tell if this is more or less um, more or less fanciful in the context of this old time song, the, the punched roll card for a piano player. Um, and in the 1920s, uh, in fact, H.T. Burley's arrangement of Oh Didn't It Rain uh, was issued as a, as a piano roll. Okay, even without these associations, uh, the poem, as with Apollinaire's visual evocation of audible voices, right? It's raining women's voices. Atkins poem also exploits this dynamic tension, I think, between the written uh, and the herd, um, not in the sense of paired herd animals, but in the, the sense of the auditory, the literary text uh, and the musical performance, the kind of uh, very uh, material punching of these piano player roles, for instance, and, and the sounds that they might produce, um, sight and sound in general, starting uh, with uh, a visual pun on the visual register, um, spy to look at, to examine, to observe closely or carefully, as the OED has it. Uh, so if we recognize uh, the spy in spiritual, um, something seen only with its own mispronunciation, only with a deformation of the, the sonic, uh, precisely the kind of close observation and discernment implied by the word itself. Um, to see the spy and spiritual makes it an allegory of its own operation. Conversely, I think we might also note that the song's original phrasing is given discursively to emphasizing spoken language. Um, in the most famous uh, recording uh, from the Newport Jazz Festival, 1958, Mahalia Jackson describes uh, and, and, and instructs, God told Noah about the rainbow sign, talk about the rain, just listen to it rain, and so on. Other versions emphasize the flood victims uh, crying out, their moaning and groaning, as well as the desperate um, entreating percussion of knocking on windows and knocking on doors. You may know uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp's uh, 1964 Manchester uh, performance. It's, it's important for the history of rock and roll, uh, where she emphasizes, quote, knock at the window, knock at the door, crying, Brother Noah, can't you take no more, uh, and so on. The title also, though, raises attention between um, the written and the sung, uh, as the song's own history charts this pivot from transcription to score. Uh, the song, as uh, Atkins and his audience would have known it in 1966, was a gospel standard. So while the song may have originated as a folk spiritual, um, Mahalia Jackson provides a useful reminder, uh, saying, quote, a lot of folks don't know that gospel songs have not been handed down like spirituals. Most gospel songs have been composed and written by Negro musicians like Professor Dorsey. She's thinking of Professor Thomas Dorsey there, um, or someone like Harry Thacker. Burley, musically, um, right, gospel elaborates on the spiritual's uh, development of choral harmony. Sorry, we'll go back to where we were. Um, apologies for that. Um, gospel adds musical instrumentation uh, to the spiritual. Um, and technically, gospel music um, is notated using standard staff scores. It's a written form, as Jackson reminds. Gospel music is authored. Spirituals, in contrast, uh, true folk songs are products of anonymous community performance traditions. They're passed on by uh, practice through oral imitation, through reiteration. Um, African-American spirituals, monophonic, uh, adapted to work songs, uh, unaccompanied by musical instruments other than uh, incidental percussion, perhaps continuing kind of corporeal claps um, 
and stomps of ring rituals uh, sounds echoed in this particular song's recollection uh, of knocking on windows, knocking on doors. So let's see if I can do this properly this time. Um, my basic point that if we read the marks in this poem as quotation marks, part of what they are quoting is a song which was itself the written transcription of an earlier oral practice uh, in which it encapsulates the history of the quotation mark uh, itself. Okay, part two. However we take uh, these indeterminate marks, uh, I think we might not expect this poem at first glance to speak to topical local politics, but it's precisely, uh, I want to argue, this distance between the cool uh, abstraction of its concrete visual poetry and the heat of the cultural moment that makes spiritual such a powerful publication. Uh, the poem as, as its chapbook uh, publication announces printed in Cleveland, uh, 1966, the very moment of mass uh, political violence following, um, you know, there were episodes in, in New York and New Jersey and Philadelphia, certainly in 1964, um, the iconic Watts riot, uh, 1965, uh, but then Cleveland really set the precedent for the hundreds of instances of civic summer turmoil that um, were going to simmer through the following year. And in Cleveland, uh, the riot centered on uh, the racially segregated uh, Huff neighborhood is spelled H-O-U-G-H, um, pronounced Huff, uh, which at the time of the riots was, quote, one of the nation's most economically depressed African-American communities. This was the epitome of the post-war American racial ghetto. Uh, protests lasted for a week. Uh, during which four bystanders uh, were murdered by vigilantes, by white police, uh, who beat uh, and arrested hundreds uh, of protesters. And if the Watts Rebellion was symbolized by looting, uh, the Huff riots were specifically marked by targeted arson. There were some 240 fires reported to authorities that week. Um, there were almost 100 fires set on, on the Thursday night alone. Uh, Charles Lucas, an AME pastor, recalls Huff was on fire. I don't know how many fires, I couldn't remember, and it burned down. Huff burned down that night. And those fires, uh, and the violence that they illuminated, only cooled by rains that eventually arrived after an unusually arid uh, two and a half weeks without any precipitation. It's unusual for the Midwest. It's, uh, it was also unusually hot. Uh, and sweltering summer, uh, even for the Midwest. But water had also been uh, the origin of the riots. The protest in Cleveland was sparked by a dispute over whether takeaway bar purchases entitled customers to a glass of water. This is like really arcane post-war Ohio liquor laws, but basically at the time, I'll do this quickly, at the time, bars also sold cheaper packaged bottles, uh, and there was a suspicion that customers would attempt to evade the rules using a water glass to drink their just purchased cheaper bottle on the premises. In any event, African-American customer uh, had bought a bottle of wine at a bar, uh, the 79ers Cafe, was refused that glass of water uh, by the suspicious uh, white proprietor, uh, and then summoning, uh, you know, images of, of Jim Crow water fountain signage, uh, the angry customer affixed an ad hoc sign to the cafe's door, ventriloquizing the white bar owner's refusal, uh, the sign read, quote, no water for uh, African Americans, though it, it uses stronger racist epithet. Uh, that sign, no water, uh, attracted increasingly enraged neighborhood crowd, uh, which turned violent, and the arson followed. So in light of these vivid particulars, how the Cleveland riots progressed from drought, no water for blacks, to flood, this torrential rains, by way of fire, all of these arsons, uh, we can begin to see the resonance of spiritual in its, its particular historical moment. That spiritual quoted by Atkins 
refers not just to the biblical flood in general, right, but to a paraphrase of God's covenant. Um, with no one, never again will life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood uh, to destroy the earth. Uh, as the lyrics of, of the song continue, um, as we saw in, 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 in the, the quote earlier, um, continue with that veiled threat uh, from God made famous as the title of a James Baldwin uh, collection and a phrase that Pete Seeger considered to be the greatest line in all of American folk music, no more water, but the fire next time. So with the wit of just the right allusion, just the right moment, Atkins calls attention to the irony of the narrative reversal in Cleveland, no water or no more water, so the fire this time followed by uh, those reigns of, of almost biblical proportion. Okay, part three. Speaking of water, um, liquidity, uh, I want to say, is also part of the witty pun that D.A. Levy, poet himself and the printer and publisher of Atkins' booklet, makes by aligning a poem titled Spiritual with a particular mode of production in the local Cleveland underground poetry scene, which developed uh, a native genre of concrete poetry uh, in its countercultural milieu. Uh, publishing scene part of what we now call the Mimeo Revolution, though the techniques uh, were slightly more varied. Uh, not only are the glyphs that proliferate through spiritual known as ditto marks, um, but the ditto machine uh, in the precise uh, terminology of mid-century print technology uh, is a type of spirit duplicator, um, so-called because um, the high level of alcoholic uh, spirits and in, in the transfer solvents of the process, it's the same volatility that enabled the Molotov cocktails used by the Huff arsonists. Uh, and like uh, Andy Warhol with with silkscreen, say, Levy embraced what most mimeographers shunned. Um, and you can see some of that um, in the print here. Um, what most mimeographers shunned and what the, the mode of production was actually prone to create, over-inking, uh, smearing, blurred and, and nebulous borders, bleeds, offset, um, misregistration. Uh, additioning variations, faint impressions from the cylinder, and so on and so on, in contrast to the clean ideal of Mimeo aspired to by institutional uses, small businesses, schools, uh, churches. Uh, Levy, on the other hand, is, is pursuing a de-skilled, sort of proto-punk aesthetic that sought a visual manifestation of the, the DIY and countercultural virtues espoused by um, the works he printed more discursively. But the smears and the smudges and wet transfers that advertised a um, hasty, improvisatory, de-skilled aesthetic might also be seen as a means for figuring the logic of the duplicator process uh, itself. Spirit duplication, really relatively damp, um, humid affair. Uh, printers would have been aware of the unfixed ink um, of the Mimeo uh, with, with every sheet uh, that, that came uh, ready to, to smear on contact and would have felt the saturated uh, moistness of, of the limp and spirit logged uh, pages as they were taken from the duplicator. I think in our, our current age of thermal toner, we might forget how remarkably uh, arid photostatics is in comparison with other printing methods. Um, but that etymology of, of Xerox, right, from, from the Greek seros, um, for dry, a good reminder of the novelty of dry printing in the age of Mimeo. But Levy's interventions with Atkins' pamphlet um, are more complicated and I think really quite brilliant. And they're, I wanna argue, a bravura performance of design decisions. Uh, on the booklet's end papers, uh, you can see the pattern uh, of a print screen that's been allowed to ink its own form there, uh, along with a, a revenant uh, few fragments um, of 
of the poem's quotation marks, uh, which have transferred before the wetting of the impression is dried, or maybe before the, the cylinder had been wiped clean. That streak and, and drizzle of the end paper screen print corroborates the association, uh, I think, of Atkins' poem with its mode of production. It's a spiritual imagining of the spirit duplicator in this very concrete rain printed with its own mode of fluid uh, expression. A fluidity there are prefigured, uh, we'll go back to uh, the title page of the booklet, which is printed letterpress, uh, and where that inverted um, open quotation mark uh, does double duty as an unspaced separating comma uh, in the place of publication, Cleveland, comma, Ohio, but looking there uh, like a drop seeping from the, the region that Levy and his, his fellow poets uh, referred to as swamp eerie. Uh, there's another vertical inversion occurring there uh, in the previous line. You can see where the spelling of press uh, with an inverted ligatured uh, double F stereotype is pressed into service as a substitute for the archaic uh, long S letter form uh, evoking this print tradition hearkening back um, you know, before the 19th century. Um, although to be punctilious, historical usage would not have employed two terminal medial S forms at the end of a word. Um, but this vertical rotation uh, is easy in Hansa letterpress printing. Um, and because an inverting mistake is so easy uh, to make foundry cast uh, pieces of lead type typically contain a nick um, to help compositors uh, instantly check that they're correctly uniformly uh, orienting the type when it's being set. In contrast, to make the inversion of just an isolated glyph um, in other modes is impossible um, or tedious. Um, I mean, even digital tools are cumbersome. Try, try flipping just one letter uh, in, in Microsoft Word even. So the inverted FF, uh, I wanna say here, doubly indexes letterpress, first through its visual evocation of an earlier moment in print history, um, in which letterpress prevailed, and then like that apostrophe made into a comma through the exploitation of one of the modes, affordances. And if Levy's eccentric um, ad hoc uh, bricolage orthography makes this blunt conspicuous gesture toward the legacy of letterpress, um, picking up on the archaic spelling of Atkins title, um, maybe that title page edition notice, first printing, 200 copies, um, also speaks to the fine press rare book conventions with which letterpress um, had come to be associated uh, over, over the, the 1960s. And yet, uh, at first glance, the page suggests maybe not so much letterpress, but rather spirit duplication with that lightly inked blue chosen by Levy to evoke the distinctive Perkins mauve of Ditto. But not only is the title page not printed on a ditto machine, it's letterpress, as we saw, the following page um, with the poem itself is not printed uh, on a ditto machine either, despite its ditto marks, but rather on uh, a mimeograph. And geek out just a moment here. These are processes that are related, um, but distinct mimeograph um, has uh, the master oriented like the print it's going to produce, so it's flipped during the printing with other duplicators like the ditto machine. In contrast, the master is a mirror image of uh, its product. So rather than forcing ink through uh, perforated stencil, uh, as in Mimeo, the ditto master, uh, waxy, sort of thick uh, sheet containing its own aniline dyes, um, had the ink debossed through the sheet, um, transferring to a copy in, in, in the solvent bath of of, of its spiritual uh, apotheosis. It's, it's, an, it's an evolution of hectography, basically. So there's a deliberate confusion and conflation of media in spiritual, which elaborates a series of technological displacements between the various modes of production used by Levy in his other underground chapbook um, and journal publishing endeavor. So by recalling one duplication mode through the means of another print process in spiritual, uh, poem fundamentally and explicitly about the act of quotation, Levy essentially quotes 
various modes of small press production by means of other modes. He's employing uh, letterpress to evoke spirit duplication, mimeo to figure ditto marks, machine duplicator stencils to recall typewriting, pressure proofing to recall screen printing, uh, these remediations adding this almost narrative variety uh, to the very short booklet and creating a, a visual texture that's analogous, I think, to the, the haptic texture of the tissue wraps of the chapbook with their flaked inclusions. Uh, and they establish a distinct rhythm uh, to the very few turnings of the codex, which moves to a new genre, uh, suggestion of a new media, production of a new media with each turn of the page. Um, beyond laying bare uh, the mode of production in these ways. Moreover, these are moments that make the process of printing part of the product. Uh, and I think Levy is folding the means into the ends here and blurring the distinction that we usually maintain between uh, printer and reader. Um, with that presentation, in fact, of that inverted, um, there we go, uh, the inverted screened end paper page, uh, Levy's actually bringing the scene of printing, uh, the moment of production into view for the reader, uh, aligning two phases in the text's history with this uncanny simultaneity, with its mirror uh, inverted image, the page appears to the reader as the stencil would uh, to the printer on the platen with, with its chiral inversion. At the same time, uh, the book's self-aware gestures extend the self-reflexive aspect of concrete poetry, the genre in which Atkins is working beyond the signifier, uh, as we would maybe conventionally conceive it, to the sign's material production. Right? This is not just the printing of a concrete poem, but printing as concrete poetry. Uh, and in the process, by transforming these literal concrete pictographs of Atkins' visual poem into a metaphor for their own printing, Levy manages, I think, this clever reversal between the abstract and the concrete by figuring the literal uh, in these ways, in spiritual. Levy's practice restores the metaphoric aspects of the spiritual through a material means and throughout uh, its etymology, um, spirit carries these connotations of immateriality in contrast to the carnal, um, corporeal, fleshy uh, material. In the case of Atkins spiritual, uh, however, we find these dynamic reversals, the symbols, printer's glyphs, as material things seen literally rather than symbolically, but then rendered symbolic of their literal mode of inscription. So as readers who are trying to attend to these reversals and follow these relays, especially when encountering the poem uh, on a screen, uh, as you are now, uh, digitally reproduced from digital scans, uh, as I have them on the Eclipse site, we are endlessly ensnared in the network of quotation marks. We no longer know how to cancel them, how to multiply them, stacking them one on top of the other. We no longer even know how to quote, uh, to quote, uh, as it were, Jacques Derrida. Okay, thank you. There we go. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> so um, as Amanda uh, has noted in the chat, uh, the Q&A is open um, and I will get to those in a moment. So for those who have questions, don't be shy. They're, they're slowly coming in. Um, I'd like to start things off uh, a little bit, Craig, uh, talking about this Atkins poem. This actually took a, uh, I'm glad I, I was thinking about Atkins myself here, so <laughs> I feel prepared for today. Um, I have a lot of questions regarding uh, 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 reading communities. I mean, a large part of um, uh, your talk today was really about um, those associations between, uh, you know, using uh, Atkins' poem as an example uh, for, uh, you know, uh, thinking about print and print legacy, looking at uh, uh, the association between, uh, you know, other genres uh, of writing previous works, uh, art connections, local politics, 
I'm wondering, because we're looking at small presses here, and we're looking specifically in this case in Cleveland at a particular time and place, um, could you give us a little more uh, information about who might have been reading uh, this pamphlet? This is uh, uh, Levy's uh, Seven Flowers Press, mid-60s. How were these works distributed? Do you know how many uh, pamphlets uh, were, were created, for example? Um, let's start there. <laughs> well, yeah, it is, it is one of the, um... I think it's one of the, the this part of this litmus test of, of how, how this poem might have been read uh, at, the, at the time. Um, same poem is, is, is published um, first, first in the Seven Flowers um, chapbook edition, 200 copies, um, which is probably fairly, fairly accurate um, number, but 200 stated. Uh, and would have been distributed, uh, you know, as part of a counterculture, um, you know, through through a bookshop, um, to you know, people at, really looking back, it's kind of endearing. I mean, you know, they're they're like they they really want to be able to smoke pot and uh, read their poetry in hipster underground cafes, um, and the poems functioning in a certain way there. Soon after, it's it's reprinted in um, a collection uh, called the Muntu Poets um, of Cleveland. Uh, it's a um, sort of um, black arts um, uh, production. And what I think is interesting is the same poem um, this looks um, particularly uh, politically engaged when it appears in Levy's milieu um, by evoking, um, I, I, I think, the, the, the moment of the riots. Um, and it looks particularly restrained and abstract among the more discursive poems um, of the Muntu poets um, who, who tend not to be playing with typography, um, but to be ex expressing more colloquial um, discursive statements about, about the, the politics. So the same poem looks very political in one place, looks much less political somewhere else. And both, um, and part of what's interesting about Atkins is he's really the hinge between these two communities in Cleveland um, that otherwise didn't overlap as, as much as they might have. Does that make sense? It does, it oh. does, yeah. And do you know, um, if uh, Atkins and, and Levy uh, had any conversations about the design of the work or uh, you know, how that collaboration went, because there's moments where it seems like there's two very distinct things happening. There's right, the writer, and then there's uh, you know, the printer or compositor or typesetter. Uh, and you and your, you know, your book you know, show that there are moments where that's very much the case. In other situations, uh, these writers bring this, you know, this um, uh, aesthetic and design and in, you know, intention with them when they you know, bring their poems. Um, uh, you know, and you know, Atkins himself was an editor of, you know, he had his own small press, he had his own journal. Uh, so he should have been incredibly, I imagine would have been incredibly mindful of you know, how these, these books were not only, uh, you know, how, how his you know, poem looked on the page, but also you know, the materiality and the binding and the actual, you know, uh, pamphlet itself and how this was put together. Yeah, I, I know that um, Atkins originally wanted uh, those, um, the marks in the poem to be um, beer gules, to be um, slash marks. Um, and it's Levy's intervention uh, mm -hmm. that puts, makes them as double quotation marks or, um, or as I say, however, however we want to read them, part, part of the, the typewriter Stenciling means that we can't we can't know for certain um, what we might have known if 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 they were letter set letterpress set um, depending on on the typeface. So um, I know Atkins didn't like that as much. Um, at the same time, I think Levy's picking up on what's distinctive about uh, all of Atkins' poetry, even when it's it's not as concrete, uh, which is a, a idiosyncratic use of um, the apostrophe. Um, which breaks up um, breaks breaks up his wor words, um, transforms um, 
nouns into into sort of participles and and things. So the though though Levy's doing something that Atkins um, hadn't suggested, I think he's also picking up on a kind of signature moment in Atkins' own innovations. Yeah, great. Uh, one one last question. Well, I'm, I'm kind of doing a close reading myself of this poem. Do you know if Atkins ever actually performed this poem, uh, or are there any recordings of him reading this poem? Uh, Not that I know of. Okay. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious how those quotation marks would have fit into that that performance. So, you know, would he have actually read, you know, stopped and read them? You know, how those pauses would have been situated. I do know that when when I when I when I've taught this poem, I often uh, often have students read it out loud, um, and it's interesting that there is there's a range of a range of performance decisions. Um, that students make that are that are quite varied. No one, no one goes to a single uh, a, a single mode. The students um, clap them out, tap them out, think of them silently, and and let them measure out pauses. Other students simply ignore them um, and just read, "Oh, didn't it rain?" Um, so it's it's certainly performable. How Atkins would have done it, I'm I'm not sure. Great. Um, I'm going to actually turn to the Q&A because we have a few of those uh, uh, posted now. Um, the first question is the following. Do you think that the upside down FF ligature was an intentional reference to the long S or a clever way to deal with the printer having run out of the letter S? Given the condition of the type, uh, there is a suggestion that the printer had very little type to work with. I like that. Um, I, I, it is definitely possible. I have, I have made similar decisions uh, in, in, in a type shop myself. Um, my guess is though that it was um, an intentional allusion um, only because Levy, well, that's a good question. I, mean, I don't know how much type he had, but um, obviously um, he wasn't using any other. He wasn't using any other type for this booklet, um, and wasn't setting that much by hand at any given time. So for those reasons, I think it's um, I think it's probably intentional. Um, but it would it, it it also fits with um, his. Um, uh, ad hoc, um, off the cuff, um, printing and design decisions. Um, so it would be in that spirit, certainly. And we have a comment in the chat that says, uh, maybe it was an accident, uh, question mark. Broken type, inspiring intention. That would be nice. So, be really um, nice. There is, there's another comment as well um, uh, in regards to, um, uh, uh, what was happening in Cleveland at the time. And uh, the comment is the same water hoses used to put out the fire may have previously been used against the demonstrators. Hmm. Or subsequently, I mean, we, 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 we certainly, certainly see them as tools of civic, um, civic institutional uh, intervent, intervention in, in Huff. Uh, the next question is, uh, is there a connection between this poem and the spiritual made by Pete Seeger, Oh Mary, Don't You Weep? Um, I'm not enough of a musicologist to say, um, you know, certainly, um, I mean, to 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 my amateur ears, they are you know it, it is part of part of a um, part of the genre of liquidity, um, and um, you know as I say, jo Jonah Noah are getting conflated. Um, I think though that they are dis I think that they are distinct works and not related um, songs. So, someone who knows more about music would have to trace that back. There's a there is a lot of um, there's a lot of scholarship, um, as I started in the twenties, um, on um, 
on American American folk songs. Um, um, Newman Ivy White, um, H.T. Burley's um, various books, um, Howard Odom, um, and and Guy Johnson's um, versions of things out of Chapel Hill. Um, be easy enough to go to go check that out. I will I will look and see. Uh, we just had another question submitted here. Um, as you described, there are metaphorical mutual relations between quotation marks, the idea of quotation, and the material production. Is this often the case in a poetics of materiality? What about poems that maybe aren't in such intense dialogue with their means of production? What, what questions do you ask of poems as you approach them? That's a really good question. Um, I think I ask the same question of the poem in the sense of wanting to listen carefully and look carefully at what it is that the, the poem and its materiality are saying. Um, I think regardless of um, regardless of the the sort of intentionality. I mean, this is why I'm I'm not um, not particularly troubled that that Russell didn't didn't like the quotation marks. Um, they are they are what we have, um, and um, you know the 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 chapter um, the chapter this is drawing from um, takes a very close look at um, exactly the kinds of quotation marks that are used when this poem, um, you know, this poem is quoted um, in say a, a review of an anthology that includes it. And all of those quotation marks are all different. Um, and so they're all doing all doing different, different things. Um, you know, I think the, another way to say this is, I, I think the dialogue with the mode of production is always, is always there. Um, but it's 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 often more it's often more muted um, and and less less explicit than than in this poem. Uh, I have a, I have a related question on um, on Atkins. Um, one of my my own you know, research interest, of course, is is on typography, especially around this period, looking at. Um, you know, concrete poetry and the futurists and all these kind of really interesting kind of graphic performative print elements that are that are happening. Um, I'm always curious, uh, you know, about uh, may maybe one poet's awareness of another group. Um, and it's always kind of tricky as a historian as well to try to, you know, prove or argue that, you know, uh, while there may have been influence uh, you know, uh, or, or while well, I can see a connection because that's what I'm reading in that moment. I'm wondering, uh, in, in this case, for example, you know, how well aware uh, was Atkins of, you know, cubist work or concrete poetry? Um, you know, I mean, often when we even think about, you know, concrete poetry, uh, there's this interesting uh, reference to that 17th century work by George Herbert, right, Easter Wings, that's always like the first, you know, example of concrete poetry. And I'm wondering, like, those guys probably never even heard of, you know, or saw that work. Maybe they did, um, but it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to prove. And I'm always, I'm just curious, you know, with uh, uh, at least in, in Cleveland's kind of counterculture artist network, uh, how well aware do you think they were of, uh, you know, these, these French impressionists and French cubists and the like, and, you know, Italian futurists? This is a really interesting question, um, and I can only give a well. I, I can give an answer, but it's it, I, I'd like to be able to give in more detail, and um, it'd be a, it's, it's a project that I, I I wish someone would would undertake because part of what interests me um, about this Cleveland scene um, is is the native. Um, development of, of concrete poetry, which they're calling concrete poetry um, in, in relation really to civic um, architecture, to, um, to poor 
concrete, steel reinforced concrete sense of concrete poetry. Um, and they're developing their own um, graphic idioms. Um, one, one of the, another thing that I, I detail in the um, book chapter um, is the, the trope of, of rain and storm and thundercloud and the visual representation of um, raindrops with slashes with, with, with um, you know, probably what are degree symbols, little, little small open, open O's. Um, and it's being developed in large part, not in dialogue with um, the international um, concrete poetry um, movement. It is though through um, the singular, particular, very important local counterculture bookstore um, that journals from that international concrete poetry movement, European journals, Ian Hamilton Finley's um, uh, poetry journals are coming to Cleveland as well. So um, it, it's certainly, it's not purely isolated, um, but it's, it's also not, I think, beginning with um, the kind of history that, that you get um, from Dick Higgins' pattern poetry or um, the, the broad network that Mary Ellen, Ellen Solt is going to, um, to, to chronicle. So uh, Cleveland is a really interesting case. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the evidence, um, you know, isn't, isn't, isn't there. I think that, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of stoners who weren't keeping good archives uh, to, to, to help us tell our story. Um, but I would, you know, I would love someone with more familiarity with um, the Asphodel bookshop um, or something like that to, to try, try to tease out when, when these poets are in dialogue um, and when, when they're just developing something um, that happens to look very much like what's going on elsewhere. Great. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to kind of blend the best I can awkwardly, uh, I will admit. Uh, my last question with one that was just um, uh, submitted. Uh, my question really had to do with about all these different hats that you wear as a printer, or as a uh, book artist, as a poet, as a scholar, uh, and as, you know, via Eclipse and other projects as uh, an archivist or, or, uh, or curator of sorts in your own right. And my question was really about how all of these different roles kind of inform one another. Um, I kind of wanted to blend that with uh, uh, this last question here that was submitted. Um, uh, and this person writes, from the UK, inspired by your method of uh, inviting your students to perform a poem. Uh, how have you performed or would you perform it yourself? So kind of a, a interesting question here. How would you perform that uh, as, as you know, being a poet yourself, but also as being a, a, a critic uh, of it, right? Oh, good. I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and, um, and, and say that, that my performance of it is, um, is maybe the scan that I made um, as I archived it on Eclipse. Um, and um, that, and I think I can answer, I, actually, I think I can give, a, give an answer to, um, to part of that, to part of your question um, that is sort of equally um, evasive, um, but I, ho I hope telling, telling in its evasions, which is one of the, um, uh, one of the criteria um, for works on Eclipse um, is, and this is part of the difficulty of, of imagining an archive of the avant-garde. Um, there's more to be said about this, but, but essentially if, um, you know, you, you can think that if the ar archives, archives are not just collecting things in the past, but collecting them for some future user. Um, and in some ways, if these works had done their poetic jobs, um, their political jobs, if they'd done their jobs in, in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, um, we wouldn't need them to be archived. Um, we'd have these lessons. They, they are essentially being held for a moment that I can't imagine, um, but I hope, I hope will come. Um, and 
part of part of what I think sets Eclipse apart from other much more pedagogic or interpretive archives uh, is there is absolutely zero metadata. Um, the descriptions I give um, are as flatly material as possible. Trim size, mode of production, if I know it, if I'm not certain, I don't say it. I don't have anything about why I think the works are important, um, which is to say that they, they are left open for things that are not my specific imaginary. Um, and so this is part of, so by, by not performing it orally, but by leaving it open to kinds of performance, um, that, is, that is part of the spirit of the archive as well, um, if, that makes, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Um, and with that, actually, I would like to thank, thank you, Craig, for joining us today. Thank you so much for letting me talk about this. It was really fun. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Craig's talk will be uh, published on the AAS YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Uh, so please uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, I would like to thank uh, each of you today for attending and for uh, continuing to make this such a wonderful program. So thank you for that. Uh, remember to uh, check out future AAS programs and to sign up for the feedback mailing list as well. Really easy to do. You can stay on track and uh, see uh, what's uh, coming down the pipeline. So uh, we have an awesome lineup this spring and summer, and I hope to see you at the next one. Uh, thank you so much. And until then, uh, bye.